Amazing. Well, welcome to the annual Robert, to, to the Robert P. Coggott Annual Lecture. It's really exciting to be here. I want to remind all of us today the theme of our learning. We have been talking about aspirational Zionism. That might have been a sign. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. We have a you know, good communication going on. We, we, are, we have been talking about aspirational Zionism. And in our conversations and our learning about aspirational Zionism, we have three different tracks. I'm just reminding you of something we heard from Ilana already yesterday. We have a track that focuses on the question of why Israel, in which we learn different ideas, different answers to that question. We have a track that focuses on the ethics of living in society. And we have a track that really focuses on concrete political visions and possibilities for the state of Israel, such as this conversation. I am really excited to have here with me Michael and Dalia, going to read their bios very soon. And they're going to be discussing the two-state solution and the confederation as two discrete political possibilities for the state of Israel. I'm going to start with Michael, who's right next to me over here. Michael Koplau is the chief policy officer of the Israel Policy Forum and also serves as a senior research fellow of the Kogod Research Center at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. Before coming to the Israel Policy Forum, he was the founding program director of the Israel Institute. He holds a PhD in government from Georgetown, Georgetown University, where he specialized in political development and ideology and the politics of Middle Eastern states. He writes Israel Policy Forum's weekly Koplau column and edits the Israel Policy Exchange. In addition to his PhD, he holds a BA from Brandeis University, a JD from New York University, and an AM in Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University. Dalia Shandlin is a public opinion expert and political advisor for electoral and social campaigns in Israel and around the world. Over the last 22 years, she has conducted public opinion research and advised on eight election campaigns in Israel and in 15 other countries. She has also conducted public opinion research for a wide range of local and international civil society organizations dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, democracy, human and civil rights, religion and state, and other progressive causes. Dalia is a policy fellow at Century International. She writes a regular column in Haaretz about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and she's a regular global affairs analyst on the BBC television program Context, and for five years co-hosted the podcast The Tel Aviv Review. She holds a PhD in political science from Tel Aviv University. It's so wonderful to have you both here, and I want to have a wide-ranging conversation about difficult subjects We've spoke a lot about the Israel that ought to be, the values that guide us, and right now I'm going to turn to you as people who spend most of your time thinking about questions of viability, what is possible, what policies should we pursue. Dali, I want to start by turning to you. I believe that you used to advocate for a two-state solution, and now you are a major proponent of the Confederation model. So I want you to tell our audience a little bit why did you change your position? And what do you mean when we speak about a confederation model? <clears throat> Is this on? OK. Good. And how long would you like me to take? Because I could take two hours just to answer that question. Two hours. <clears throat> OK, OK. OK, first of all, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. It's always nice to share a stage with Michael, and I'm very happy to be meeting everybody here. Yeah, I would say that's a fair way to describe the first uh, 40 years of my existence, basically, was as a supporter of a two-state solution uh, because I became interested in Israel from a very young age, growing up in the US, in New York. I moved to Israel in 1997, largely because I thought Israel was moving ahead towards a new phase in its history of peaceful, or at least building a process of peaceful relations uh, with the Palestinians. We were, on the, we were making this happen. At least I saw myself as part of this country that was moving ahead towards making some sort of peace happen. Um, and I wanted to be part of it. Honestly, it was a big part of the reason why I moved to Israel to begin with. Uh, what we call the Oslo years. Okay, this was the Oslo years. Now, I think that after that, I became involved in politics and I became involved in uh, working for the first, let's say the first campaign I ever worked on was for the Labor Party with Ehud Barak. And when we won in 1999, took over the, uh, the prime minister role from Netanyahu, the biggest item on the agenda, one of the biggest items, was that Ehud Barak was going to do two things, leave Lebanon and make peace with the Palestinians. 
and if possible, maybe also peace with Syria. I thought I was like on the top of the world. You know, here I was in the country barely two years, and I'm involved with the advisors who are working on these issues, and it all was a huge failure. And it was very demoralizing. The next thing you know, the Intifada breaks out, and everything is put on hold, and there is no real peace process, and I'm working for all of the organizations who are trying to advance peace. And it, I take it for granted at this point that peace means a two-state solution. That was the basic kind of implication of the Oslo Accords, even though the Oslo Accords never actually used the term two-state solution or talked about a Palestinian state, but the negotiations under Ehud Barak and Camp David definitely put the concept of a Palestinian state next to Israel on the agenda, and it became a paradigm. And all of the years when there was nothing happening and it was just a few, you know, the remaining groups of people who still believed we should be advancing peace, it was understood that the best and only way to do that was for Palestinians to have national self-determination in their own state, uh, on the other side of the green line exactly where we weren't sure. But we pretty much thought, you know, some big settlement blocks would be part of Israel, all the rest for Palestine. To be honest, during the 2000s and those very difficult years, we weren't too concerned with the details because the biggest challenge was just to get anybody to maintain interest in the idea of reaching a negotiated peace as Israeli society was very rapidly you know, fleeing from the entire issue. They just thought there's nothing that can be done, this is a disaster, and it was. A decade goes by, I'm fast forwarding, and we get to the beginning, let's say 2010-11, is when I started to, I, you know, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I think I started to just, after being a public opinion researcher and spending so much of my time um, either trying to enter the public mind through numbers or watching focus groups, which means you're sitting behind the glass, you know, one-way glass, watching people, and you definitely get people's attitudes into your, you know, into your system. But for whatever reason, my career took a somewhat different direction. I started spending more time in the places where we have the conflict, in Jerusalem, going to visit settlements. I started just being in the field more for various reason, reasons. And I think the more I saw close up myself, all these things that I had been analyzing for policymakers and for NGOs and for peace activists, and I had been analyzing and analyzing them through the perspective of the public, suddenly I was seeing myself, what, is Jeru what are we talking about when we talk about dividing Jerusalem? Are we, are we kidding? Are we crazy? Because you know, there's no line through Jerusalem. The neighborhoods are completely intertwined. Of course, you have de facto divisions and great inequality of the Israeli and Palestinian neighborhoods that were annexed in you know, uh, after the 67 war. But if you look at the map, and I started to really understand it once I was seeing it on the ground, the map looks something like this, East and West Jerusalem. And the populations are increasingly interdependent. They don't exactly socialize together, but they're increasingly economically independent. I started to realize, like, to actually put a physical partition between the city, which is what we thought in, 19, in, in, 2000, in the year 2000, we thought was an incredible breakthrough to try to convince Israeli society to make this very painful compromise, to reach a two-state solution. And then I realized on the ground, it doesn't even look remotely like reality. So that started to raise questions in my mind. Of course, I was always tracking not only the growth of settlements, because we started to understand how many, you know, the numbers. We went through the disengagement, how difficult it was to pull 8,000 families to withdraw from Gaza. The numbers were growing and growing, but suddenly being in the field more, going around, actually visiting settlements in different locations and understanding where they were, I realized it wasn't just about the numbers. It's about where they are throughout the West Bank. And we, you know, just to bring you completely up to speed, in the year 2020, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, then Prime Minister Netanyahu, had a plan for annexing the Jordan Valley. And so we started thinking about, you know, I started looking up how many settlements are in the Jordan Valley, and there are dozens of them and thousands of settlers. And so basically the future Palestinian state, if it's gonna be a complete sovereign state, is surrounded by blocks of settlements on one side, blocks of settlements on the other side, and all the tendrils going through. And I thought, how, how do these ever get separated? So physically I started to think it was almost impossible. And I, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, but I also started to realize that part of the problem with settlers, and this is where it gets very tricky for left-wingers, is that some of them were born there at this point. This isn't a matter of ideologues who said, we know this is illegal under international law, we're going to do it anyway because we have an ideological mission. We're talking about second generation, we're talking about people who that's all they've ever known. And I started to think strategically, on the one hand, strategically, 
it's not, do, it's not helping the cause to demonize them and say, you are the entire reason, because these are people who were just born there. It wasn't really their decision. But is it also really viable legally, politically, to force people to leave their homes? And so I started to rethink these things. And then I realized other people were thinking about it as well. And that the, two, the idea of a confederation, which I, I don't maybe I'll stop before getting into every part of it, but that started to raise questions about whether the two-state separation is ever going to be feasible. Uh, and the two-state confederation says, well, you can still have two states. It's still a two-state proposition. I think that needs to be very clear. We're talking about separate governments, separate legislature, separate executive. But two states that cooperate based on a, a sort of a infrastructure of cooperation on limited areas where you have open borders, that doesn't mean no security, it doesn't mean no borders, it means that you have collective freedom of movement and you work on security as an individual threat rather than a collective restriction. Um, and so this is a sort of hybrid model and that it exists in other parts of the world, you know, we, in different places in different times, but there are different examples around the world that take pieces of this, and so I can see elements of it in action, specifically on the issue of freedom of movement, for example, we can look at the EU. But the idea of disconnecting residency from citizenship is a big piece of it. And that says that people can live as permanent residents on the other side, but they will only be citizens in the country of their nationality, and they will only vote for the national parliament, the legislature, in the country of their nationality. So that opens up new ideas for settlers. And it leaves them a choice. And it also respects the fact that they have a connection to the land. And maybe we all do as Jews, right? I know that the Jew Jewish history has a connection to all of the land. I have a pragmatic, you know, less theologically inspired approach that I don't mind giving it up. But I understand that many people don't. I also understand that this is the Palestinian vision as well. They have a connection to all of the land. Their historic memory of all of the land is not very far back. It doesn't go back 5,000 years. It's only two generations before. And that the right of return has always been one of the issues that destroyed negotiations. It has been among the most problematic issues at every level, at every time. And as a public opinion researcher, I see the numbers. Basically, it's the number one factor of Palestinian insistence and the number one factor of Israeli resistance. So there's no breaking through that unless you think of a new approach. I knew that. So, Dali, just to clarify, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. When we're talking about this new approach, we're not talking about what some call maybe like a divorce, right? A separation. There's something here about having like two states, right? With, with different people living in different places. Citizenship is not tied to residency, right. as you said. And it implies a high level of cooperation, collaboration. collaboration. You have Did to, you? because if you have minorities of your citizens living on the other side, you have to have robust mechanisms of cooperation, particularly on security. But it also reflects reality. In reality, economically, we are basically one economic zone right now. Very unequal, right, Un under very unequal political terms, mm -hmm. but instead of trying to create a, a new economic life for the Palestinians from scratch and cut them off from their major employers, markets, you know, I mean, you basically you think about Jerusalem, you know, one of the best researchers on Jerusalem, Mark Stern, has done a paper years, a few years ago explaining that about half of the workforce in East Jerusalem depends on Israeli or companies either for their labor or for their markets. And so these societies are very economically integrated too, but we do have two nations and each one needs national self-determination and there is a territorial dimension to it. So I think that the idea is to find a hybrid model. So I don't see it as a radical departure from the two state solution. I see it as essentially two states. You don't have a central government, but you have a built-in infrastructure of cooperation on the issues that are in a way inseparable and you disconnect residency from citizenship, which is not a radical concept. It was already around in resolution 181, the partition plan in 1947. Um, and then you talked about like, where is this coming from in terms of like my value system? Once I started to look at the pragmatics of it and see the disconnect between what I thought was no longer viable on the ground, within a few, I think it took a couple of years for me to say, actually, what was I thinking? I mean, because the idea of a two-state ethno-nationalist partition suddenly seemed to me very illiberal. It you says know what, I want to yes. let, yes. let okay. Michael respond to this, because he's Fine. going to speak about a two-state solution. Fine. Um, so, so let me ask Michael right now. Well, first of all, Dalia said that the idea of a conf from confederation is not a radical departure, right? So I want to first hear you respond to that. Do you view it as a radical departure from the position of a two-state solution? And a second question is, 
Um, how do you explain the fact that you continue to uh, uphold the idea of a two-state solution, even as there are more and more critics who look at it and who say it's not, it's not viable? So thank you, Michal, and uh, always, always great to be alongside Dahlia. So um, I actually I, I agree with I agree with much of Dahlia's diagnosis of the problem, and one of the difficulties of supporting two states is that it's a very unsatisfying solution. I think that Dahlia's description of it as illiberal in many ways is correct. And I think that's why it strikes a lot of people, and I'll, I'll include myself in this, um, it strikes a lot of people as a very less than ideal solution. I've actually stopped using the term two-state solution. Um, Good to know. I use the term two-state outcome. I'm, it's, been, it's been years since I actually, I think, wrote uh, the phrase two-state solution. Because it's not a solution in the sense that it's going to solve for every problem. Um, but from my perspective, the problems I'm trying to solve for are, one, how do you keep Israel both Jewish and democratic? Two, how do you do that in a way that allows for Palestinian national self-determination and Palestinian sovereignty? And three, how do you do it in a way that can hopefully overcome some of the thorniest issues and barriers on both sides. And if you take those three things as your starting point, from my perspective, even though it is, as I said, um, not very morally satisfying, a two-state solution remains the, the best way to try and get to all of those things. Now, you know, when we, when we talk about settlements, you know, th this is, I think, uh, obviously the biggest issue with two states. It's the biggest barrier. Um, you know, Dahlia, Dahlia correctly points out that settlements have expanded and they're all over the place. Um, and that, I think, for a lot of people means that when you look at the possibility of separation, it seems as if it's no longer possible. And I think that um, something that Dahlia said is, is key, right? What's key is location and not just numbers. And there are different ways of looking at that. So there are 127 settlements, legal settlements in the West Bank. There are uh, just over 200 illegal outposts. Some of them are uh, communities of, of a few hundred people. Some of them are uh, three farmers and, and, a, and a sheep pen. Um, and the illegal outposts in particular are scattered all over the place. Um, but it's also the case that when you look at where most people live, they are still living in spots where separation is not all that difficult. Um, about 78% of all Israelis living over the Green Line, which is about 520,000 people, live on 3.9% 3 3 of the territory over the Green Line, and that 3.9% of territory is all right, right along the Green Line. There are uh, only 12 settlements in the entire West Bank that have 5,000 people or more. Nine of them fall into this category of settlements that are sitting right along the Green Line and it would be included in land swaps. And so, you know, we're still talking about big numbers, right? We're still talking about over 100,000 Israelis living in the West Bank who, in any type of two-state outcome where you have separation, they would have to leave. Um, but the perhaps somewhat hopeful news there is that of that roughly 130, 140,000 people, well over 50% of them say that they will leave for compensation or if the Israeli government takes a democratic decision to tell them to leave. And so once you factor that in, we're now down to 30,000, 40,000 people who say they will not leave. That's a big number, right? This is, this is not trivial. And um, again, when people, when people look at these numbers, uh, they say, how are you going to get 30,000 or 40,000 people out of there? That's a, that's a real problem. Um, and it's not one that anybody should uh, trick themselves into thinking won't be difficult. But from my perspective, if you say to Israelis, the choice is between evacuating 30 to 40,000 people who don't want to be evacuated versus a situation where you have 
borders that are porous and have some sort, some form of freedom of movement, for most Israelis, that's a non-starter due to security. So you're contrasting right now to state outcome with the confederation model. You're saying for most Israelis, that's not something... Correct. I think for most Israelis, the notion that, you know, in a country where security dominates everything, the notion that you will have greater freedom of movement that, than you do now without real security guarantees, I think for most Israelis, that's, that's a non-starter. Um, and so the question of viability, I think there's sort of a hierarchy. Now, the other thing I think that's important to note is that two states versus confederation, to my mind, is not a dichotomy. It's a continuum. Um, Jerusalem is a, is a great example. I agree with Dahlia. Jerusalem is going to be a shared city in, in any solution that works, Jerusalem will be shared between Israelis and Palestinians. And Jerusalem is a place where you are almost certainly going to have to have some sort of confederal model. Economics as well. Um, Dahlia points out, again, correctly, that these two economies are very intertwined. Um, the Israeli economy runs on cheap Palestinian labor. Um, you have, uh, you have and, I think the latest numbers are 140,000 Palestinians from the West Bank who have work permits to come in daily. You have uh, now it's going up to 14,000 this week uh, Palestinians from Gaza who have permits to enter Israel to work daily. These economies definitely are dependent on each other. And so in that sense, you're going to have to have some sort of confederal model as well. But the trust between the two sides is so low right now, they can't even agree to sit in the same room. Um, you know, Benny Gantz will meet with Mahmoud Abbas, but uh, Prime Minister Bennett, um, still, still Prime Minister Bennett for, for a few days, uh, Prime Minister Bennett um, will not meet uh, with, with Mahmoud Abbas. Yair Lapid will, but only if there is no discussion of political issues. This is, this is, this is the, the level of trust we're talking about. And so to jump from, from that to a confederation where you're not just talking about the economy, but you're also talking about um, having to work out security arrangements. Um, you're, talking to have to work, you're talking about working out arrangements on all sorts of minute things. I think, you know, would I ever say that that's impossible? No, it's not impossible. Um, but I think, I think it's, 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 very, it's very far off. Um, and so, you know, to, to my mind, there's going to be some sort of confederational aspect to a two-state outcome. But jumping, jumping to the end of that process um, I think uh, I think is difficult. And then last last thing on this, um, I think part of the attractiveness of, of confederation is that you do have these difficult issues of settlement and of right of return, and they're thorny, and nobody's been able to figure them out. And uh, we're in a place now where the Palestinians, if there's one issue that they're really not prepared to to give on or talk about, it's right of return. On the Israeli side, we're now living in a world largely as a result of the Trump plan, where uh, the new basis for uh, Israel's starting point is that no settlement will ever have to be evacuated, because that was a component of the Trump plan, and Israeli politicians jumped on that. And uh, you know, these, are, these are, of course, um, these, are, these are difficult issues, and, and they're big barriers. But there's also something to me very difficult about saying, you have settlers who don't want to leave, so let's let them act as spoilers and give in to that. Um, I, have a, I, have, I have difficulty with conceding the point to the people who are most resistant to the outcome that still enjoys, for now, a plurality of support on both sides, um, still has the support of almost the entire international community, and you know, even though it's an idea that's been around a long time, and so in some ways is viewed as passe. Um, there's a reason it's been around for a long time, um, because it is still theoretically workable and theoretically the best way to accomplish the things that, that I laid out in the beginning. So, so I, I am still on the two-state bandwagon. Um, you know, I think, I think, like many people, there is a point of no return for that, um, but I don't think we're there yet. All right, we're going to get there soon, and I want to ask a little bit about the values conversation, but Dahlia, you want to jump in first? On to many things, I'll try to keep them short. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that it's been around so long is evidence of the failure of the two-state solution. I think it's evidence that we've had multiple rounds of trying to negotiate to get to a two-state solution, and it hasn't been an attractive enough aim 
for the negotiators to make the necessary concessions, and that's why we're not there. So I see that as not exactly in its favor. I'll go through the other one very quickly because I want to leave time for questions. Um, the idea that the Confederation involves freedom of movement without security guarantees. No, it involves security guarantees. That would be part of a negotiation. We have lots of ideas about how to do security. Um, and so there are guarantees. Of course, in a two-state solution, the fact that Israel essentially in all of the negotiations plans on remaining on the eastern border means that there are security arrangements that the Palestinians simply haven't agreed to. So that's a real problem. It also doesn't confer real sovereignty because you're talking about two independent states, but in fact Israel controls the external borders, which I think is part of the reason why the Palestinians have been rejecting those plans. They say they're not, it's not really sovereignty. Um, in terms of Jerusalem, I'm glad you accept the confederal aspects in Jerusalem, but I would say Jerusalem is the one part of this plan that looks more like a federation. So <laughs> we can talk about it afterwards. But Jerusalem, I think, would be essentially a municipal government, a single municipal, municipal government representing all the communities in, this, in my vision. Let me just talk quickly about the question of trust, and then I promise I will turn it over. I, 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 no question. We don't, there's no disagreement on exactly how bad the situation is now and how little trust there is, but I see trust at two levels or the problem of trust. At the leader level, at the level of the elites who have to sit together and make the agreements, yes, they are in a, the worst, maybe the worst state in the last 20 years. That is a problem for any agreement. That's a problem for reaching a two-state agreement or a confederation or cantons or, you know, Jordan is the Palestinian state. There is no agreement right now because the leaders won't sit together. So that's, I see that as the basis for all of our discussions, not, not something that distinguishes the two-state solution. In terms of the level of trust between people, yeah, I agree with you on some level that, of course, I'm not agreeing. I mean, survey research shows time and again how little trust there is between the people. The question is if we are looking at values and the future, the long-term future, because we can all agree none, neither of these are happening tomorrow, sadly. But in the long-term future, how are we going to raise that trust between the people? Are we going to raise the trust by having a hard partition between them? And to my mind, watching the Palestinian state deteriorate for lack of feasibility and them being continually angry because they have a failing economy and they're isolated and, you know, probably, I, I can't imagine how, I, I don't know, I just see them as a cutoff kind of strange, chopped up, you know, group of bubbles of land where they don't feel like they've had actually resolution in that situation. And I think that it will be a bad situation, except that they won't have much contact. So I'm not sure how we raise trust. On the other hand, if we allow the majority of both peoples who are essentially regular people, not spoilers, not terrorists, not, you know, I mean that of either side, not violent, the kind of people who come in every year in the tens of thousands on Ramadan from the West Bank to go to the beach in Israel, and there's almost never any attacks. If every day is like that, then we have more exposure to people. Now, if you don't believe the contact hypothesis that exposure leads to trust, we could all be wrong about that. But I think that it's a question of what you think will help to change that current situation in the future. So I wanted to explain that's part of the vision. Yeah, let me, let me just raise something from what you're saying, because Dalia, you just spoke about having like a long-term vision. And both of you also spoke not only about policy and different facts and figures that has to do with different uh, viable options for the future, but also we started mentioning values. And as you two were speaking, I actually started thinking about the Torah portions that we've been reading, at least in the US. We're about to read the parasha that talks about the scouts going to check out the promised land, right? And I'm just gonna remind all of us that there were a group of 12 scouts sent, and I'm gonna talk about a promised land not only as a territorial place, but perhaps a utopian space in which we can look at each other as human and have more peace and understanding between peoples. And 10 of them came back and said, we cannot do it. And two of them came back and said, yes, we can. But the two of you, unlike, unlike Caleb and Joshua, you're not only saying, yes, we can, you also have a blueprint for how to get there. And the question that I want to pose to you in this conversation, which also relates to our discussions about values and morals and aspirational Zionism, is I would love for you to reflect, maybe starting with Michael, uh, how does the question of viability, of political viability, what role does that, place, does that play in the moral conversation? When you're trying to have a moral calculus to offer the best possible blueprint forward that has embedded within it moral aspirational values, what role does political viability play in it? That, that's a great question. Um, so I think there, there are obviously different ways of looking at this question of morality. Um, 
one way would be would be a Kantian way, right? Um, you know, we can we can say there there are categorical categorical imperatives here, um, and if you look at two states, this notion that uh, you're going to have to have separation, people um, people aren't going to have enough trust to live together. Um, you know, it's as I as I said earlier, in a lot of ways, it's not a morally attractive solution, and I think certainly, um, you know, from that framework, it's not. Um, but I think there's also the question of morals from a utilitarian perspective. And if you look at it that way, then to me, a two-state outcome starts to look a lot better. Um, because assuming that you can get there, you satisfy both sides' national aspirations, you satisfy the, the Israeli existential fear over security, and, and I'll just note there that um, the majority of Israeli security experts believe that um, leaving the West Bank will leave Israel more secure than staying in the West Bank forever. You get to a spot where you don't have a perfect solution, again, why, why I don't use the term solution, um, but you create a lot of good for a lot of people even if, it's, even if it's not perfect. And to me, that's where the political viability question comes in. If we were to throw politics out, then I think there, there are different models that um, I would find personally more attractive than two states. Um, when, when, when I was, uh, I, did, I did the Identity Crisis podcast with Yehuda about six weeks ago, and one of the things we talked about on the podcast um, was I have a deep personal attachment to the West Bank. Um, I feel far more attached to the West Bank than I do to Tel Aviv. Um, oftentimes, I, oftentimes, I, oftentimes I wish that uh, the things, things here were flipped, um, that the Israeli state we were talking about would be, would be Judea and Samaria, and the Palestinian state would be uh, ancient, ancient Philistine on, on the coast. Um, but that's not where we are, and the fact that I happen to love the Judean desert um, isn't, isn't for me um, a, a good enough reason for Israel to, to be there forever. Um, and so in my own calculus, political viability plays a big role, and I think that to dismiss the political viability aspect when it comes to moral calculations is also, um, is also missing, missing part of the, the equation. Dalia? That's a great question. I, I'm, I thank you for that question. Uh, I want to go back, though, to the point about utopia. Let me make it clear. I, I fundamentally agree with you that there is no perfect solution. I don't want to pretend that this is some sort of you know, utopian solution that solves all the problems. When I said there are security guarantees, I did not mean you can guarantee every person's security. I don't know of any place in the world where everybody's security is guaranteed. And I think that part of the problem in this region is that we have started to look at it as if, if there is one violation of security, whether it's a you know, rock thrown or somebody pulls the scissors or a suicide bomb, then it's all over. And I think that that's not a good measure because it's you know, sacrificing the better for this outcome of the perfect. So I wanted to just start off by saying that. Um, in terms of- and, and we never do reach the promised land. Right, and we never the Bible do. either, so yeah, agreement there. Okay, yeah. so um, I do think there's a role for morality in political viability, and I don't think they're two different, entirely indistinct things. I think that they play uh, an important role in supporting one another. And I say that as a political strategist, for one thing, because you know political leaders are answerable to their constituencies. And we say, well, maybe the other side isn't democratic enough, but you know what? Non-democracies have to be even more aware of their constituencies because there's no good outlet for constituencies getting angry. So they all, they all know the limitations on what they can do. Whether, uh, and when I, when I say moral, um, I have to confess that I have in my mind sort of morphed into the question of justice. And there is a question of justice on both sides. Okay, for the Palestinians, when they say justice, primarily they're talking about 48. They're talking about the refugee question. Now, one of the reasons they, they can't give up on it is not really because, you know, I think it's less about them wanting to bring every person and the descendants back to, you know, in the Green Line Israel, and more about the acknowledgement. Because for, so many, you know, for all these decades, there has been, certainly on Israel's part, a denial of what happened or who's responsible for it. Anyway, I think that the sense of justice for them, or the sense of injustice, is one of the main reasons they have not wanted to be a part of any of the negotiations, or the accords, or ne never wanted to reach the accords, because there was a sense that they're, they're, they were not given justice for what happened in 48, which didn't only have to mean coming back to Israel, right? In the other negotiations, there was a whole menu 
of options for Palestinian refugees. The Confederation idea, by the way, does not, get re does not reject any of those. We build on what's been done. If there's a menu of options, like returning to a Palestinian state, getting citizenship in a third country, getting compensation, acknowledgement, all of that remains, with an additional option of Israel being a little more generous about allowing those who want to to live as permanent residents inside Israel. But they would only be able to vote in Palestine. So that's a sense of acknowledging, not that there's gonna be, not that Israel should open its doors to millions of refugees, but that there is a justice factor. And without that, the Palestinians will never agree to end the conflict. And on the Israeli side, you know, what we're seeing to this day, say 15, no, what are we, 17 years after the disengagement from Gaza, the sense of injustice among the residents of Gush Katif have fundamentally changed the political face of this country because there was a sense that they were forced. Okay, there was a democratic process, but it was forced on them that they had to move, and that was 8,000 people. And that has completely changed the face of activity, of the activity of the settler community and of the right-wing communities. It's made it you know, it's driven many of the processes that are making it much harder to reach anything like a restraint on settlements. You know, even a freeze now is way beyond where the policy discussions are. The only policy discussion we're having now is how much to annex. Or maybe we should put off naming annexation. So the point is, if we now come with a plan that says 140, 170, I mean, the numbers vary depending on where you think the borders go. We are forcing you to evacuate. If you want, you can take compensation, but you don't have a choice in the matter, okay? I think that's gonna create a new generation and a much bigger generation of people who feel that another injustice has been done to them. And to my mind, that perpetuates conflict. So I think that that will give rise to a new generation of people who are fighting to undermine the agreement. Some of them may do it violently, and that damages political viability. Right. What, what I'm hearing you say, Dahlia, is that policy experts need to pay attention to the moral language of the peoples because that ends up shaping the political viability of any solutions that can be offered. You said it much more concisely oh, than me. Can I just weigh in on, on, on one point? So um, I agree. Evacuating however many it is, 140, 170,000 people, um, and saying this is a decision of the government and, and you don't have a choice, um, will absolutely cause resentment. Uh, I do think a lot of the resentment over the uh, disengagement from Gaza comes not entirely over the disengagement itself, but over the fact that promises were made to the 8,000 people who were evacuated and um, that, were, that were not kept. And so I think there's a lot of anger about this idea that the Israeli government abandoned Israeli citizens, not not Did you Israeli, do a not, better job for 140,000 people? Well, I think, I, think you can, I think you can certainly try, right? You can, you, can, you can make the preparations ahead of time as opposed to what happened last time, which was basically nothing. Um, I agree, it will cause resentment, but you know, there's also a great danger, I think, in um, allowing everybody to stay where they are because that has the potential to cause resentment and violence as well. You know, if, if we look around now, every, every year, the Palestinian Authority security forces um, evacuate hundreds of Israelis from Area A who, who wander in. I think the last, uh, I think in 2021, the number was something like 530 or 540 Israelis. It almost never makes, makes, makes the papers or the news because it's so routine. And it almost always happens um, safely where the PA security forces come in and they get Israelis out. But the reason they have to do that for hundreds of people every year is because even the appearance of an Israeli in Area A sparks a mob and sparks riots and leads to the potential deaths of Israelis just for being in Area A. When we look at the way not all, um, but certainly some settlers, particularly in Samaria and the Northern West Bank, behave toward Palestinians, um, and you know, we've had unfortunate incidents um, just this week alone, um, particularly one very bad one where a Palestinian was, was stabbed in the heart and killed by a settler. Um, you know, these, are, these, are, these are awful dynamics. I wish that they were not the case. But to me, the idea that if we leave people where they are, that that will solve the problems, I think that um, that creates a different set of problems. And you know, again, with, with all of these, the, the question for me is, which one of these is, is likely to be less worse? Because none of these, none of these options are good. Um, and to my thinking, separation into two states still remains the least worst option, even though it's not attractive for many reasons.
Right, and I guess I the, a technical point on oh, that. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah. I didn't. I don't think I clarified this first. The idea of delinking citizenship and residency and allowing people to live as permanent residents is conditional on two things. First, they have to accept the sovereignty of the other side. If they're not planning to live under Palestinian law, or if Palestinians aren't planning to live under Israeli law, they don't. They lose that right, and if they break the law, they lose the right. So they have to be law-abiding as well. Sovereignty and law abiding. So just to point that out, people who have a demonstrated record, you know, in, as soon as this arrangement were to go in, who break the law by attacking somebody will lose the right to be there altogether. In my, in my vision, there are other people working on this, but that's a pretty common feature. Right. So just, just to follow on that, so in, in that scenario, then, many of the people who want to stay the most are also, unfortunately, the ones who are least likely, on the Israeli side at least, to accept Palestinian sovereignty, meaning that they probably have to leave anyway. Absolutely. Um, I would say that we, they probably shouldn't be judged by previous behavior, but more like how they behave once they make that decision to stay. Um, and on the other hand, you, this is a point that I know you've raised in other forums that, you know, the Confederation point isn't, that doesn't help us because the people who would be most resistant to this are the ones who would be the candidates for remaining, especially if there is some sort of, you know, uh, um, land exchange with the big blocks. That's true. but. For, but why do we think those people would be any more likely to accept being uprooted by force? At least in this way, they'll have a choice. Now, I don't want to, again, I'm not going to oversell how easy this is. I mean, I, you know, I've talked to many settlers, including the most radical, and they want nothing less than full Jewish sovereignty. I know that that's the distinction. You know, when I started working on this, I thought it was a great idea because I said, well, it, it recognizes their attachment to the land. I had to learn that that was not really what most, you know, the, the really ideological settlers care about. They care about the land, but they care about sovereignty over the land. Maybe some of them will make the choice on their own not to stay. And you know what? If there's not a huge incentive for them to stay, I'm not going to cry. I mean, it probably is better for the people who really can't, you know, live with each other to remove themselves. But it does take away the element of coercion and the element of blame and the element of you know, these pictures of the government, the army coming in and destroying, you know, pulling people away from their homes by force, I, I, I think it's more than just resentment. I think it creates a real generational change and affects all of political life here. So I, I'm really enjoying the part of this Bet Midrash experience is to really see pluralism at work and to see very passionate articulations of different blueprints uh, to move forward. I wanted to ask both of you to reflect a little bit on the following question. When you think about, you know, your, your not solution, your, your outcome, right? <laughs> your proposed plan forward. Is there right now in the discussion about what Israel is, the trends that are happening, can you envision like a point of no return? That if certain things were to happen on the ground, then you say, you know what, this plan that I had, it just can't happen anymore? And if so, I'm gonna add a second question, because a lot of our conversation that we've been having right now has been about relationship, moral alignment, North and South American Jews and Israel, um, if there is that point of no return, and if hypothetically we were to reach that point of no return, I'd love for you to reflect a little bit about the implications for yourself in terms of how you relate to the project that is Israel. I'm going to start with you, Michael. For me, there, there absolutely is a point of no return. Um, that, that point of no return, I think, is, uh, is annexation of Area C. Um, I spent can you explain to everybody why that is the point of no Sure. You know, so Area, Area C is 60% of the West Bank. Um, it's where uh, all of the Israelis who are living in the West Bank are situated. It's not in, it's not, uh, it, Area C itself is contiguous, but not, not in the way you think. Um, it's effectively a spider web that creates 169 islands of areas A and B. Um, so if you annex Area C, you're not annexing kind of a, a, distinct, um, a distinct place. Um, you're annexing a spider web, um, which makes it, uh, it makes it, it will be simply impossible to impossible to defend from a security perspective. It um, will make it impossible for for Palestinians to exist in their daily lives. It's it, it's a plan that is um, completely unworkable in any in any conception, um, and yet we've seen on the Israeli right. Um, this plan that originated way back when, uh, or popularized, I should say, way back when, by Naftali Bennett, uh, to annex Area C. Um, he actually had a, a famous, uh, a famous campaign ad about this, where he literally uh, it was three, three rectangles. One said A, one said B, one said C, and he had Palestinian flags next to A and B, and an Israeli flag next to C, um, making it seem as if this is kind of a, a very easy, neat, neat thing to do. They were all the same size. Yes, they were all the same size. 
Um, so annexing Area C would be a disaster. Um, I spent almost every day for, uh, I don't know, I think it was, it was a year and a half, two years, um, uh, when, when annexation first kind of started to, to bubble up, uh, up until um, basically the Abraham Accords, when it went away temporarily, um, almost every single day of my professional life, um, speaking about annexation, explaining it to people, talking about why it would be so bad, doing everything I could um, within uh, US policy circles and within the American Jewish community to avoid it. Um, and for a little while, it went away. Um, but to me, that's the red line, and that's one of the reasons that I, I, that I spent so much time um, obsessing over the issue and trying to get other people to obsess over it as well. Because if that happens, given all of the implications, two states, the game, the game is over. Um, now, what does that mean for, for me personally? Um, you know, this, this calls back to, to what Michal spoke about this morning. I definitely feel the moral value of being in relationship with Israel. I am a proud Zionist. I can't imagine a scenario in which I would feel that my relationship to this place has been completely severed. Um, but something like annexation of Area C, which effectively means permanent Israeli non-democratic control over, at the moment, two and a half million, but sure to grow, two and a half million Palestinians um, until the end of time, that's not something that I can accept. It's not something I can support. And so um, it's hard for me to say how that would change my relationship with Israel on a day-to-day -day basis and in practical terms, but I would find it, I would find it personally devastating. It would, be, it would be an enormous um, crisis for me of morality. Um, it would be an enormous crisis for me professionally. Um, it, would be, it would be a crisis on, on every single level. And, uh, part of why I, I remain firmly in uh, the two-state camp, even as it looks increasingly difficult to, uh, to obtain, um, and even as more people um, roll their eyes at it, and even as uh, you know, it seems like something whose time has passed, it's because of this um, personal crisis more than anything else. I need Israel to be both Jewish and democratic. And if it's not, then um, a large part of my identity will be stripped away. And um, frankly, I, I don't want to have to contemplate what that, what that, will, what that will mean for me uh, on a daily basis. I, 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 I feel like I'll, I'll sort of be like, uh, like Voldemort when, when Harry Potter starts destroying Horcruxes, right? Like, a little piece of me will, will die every time. Um, so I would like to avoid that. <laughs> Powerful metaphor as a big Harry Potter fan. Uh, no, thank you, Michael. Um, Thank you for that. Dalia, what's your, is there a point of no return in terms of a confederation model? Because part of what I was intrigued by with the confederation model is it doesn't seem to have, uh, maybe I'm wrong, I would love to hear from you, does it have like a temporal frame, like we need to do certain things in a certain time frame in order to move forward. So is there a point of no return? And if so, what is your, what would be your hypothetical reaction to that? I mean, I want to talk about two points of no return. One is uh, with relation to an actual plan for resolving the conflict or improving the conflict, let's say, because I agree, there's no perfect solution. We talked about it. Um, I do think there are points of no return, including for the Confederation. Let's face it, I mean, with all of the effort to try to bring in as many of the settlers who are willing to commit to some sort of conflict resolution in a way that can work for them, the fewer there are, the better, if we're ever going to have a resolution that allows Palestinian self-determination. So the more, there is some critical number. I don't know what that number is right now. Yes, we are trying to think of a way to accommodate the settlers who are there, but the bigger that population gets in the areas that are supposed to be a Palestinian state, the harder that becomes. So you know, with a similar problem with the two-state solution as well. Um, but I would say that in terms of the point of no return, annexing Area C, yeah, I would just have to say my analysis is a little bit different. Yes, we paused the conversation on legit, you know, le legalized, declared annexation, or what we call de jure annexation. But we have not paused de facto forms of annexation on the ground, really not once since 1967. It is continuing today. In, in many analyses, it, it has accelerated under the new government. And I mean that also in, you know, settlements are one way of looking at it. In fact, they're the easiest way of looking at it because they're visible. What about all the things we don't see? 
all the land that has been earmarked for settler agriculture, for settler farms and uh, ranches, military firing zones. This is what's going on in South, South Hebron Hills right now. That's why we have to evacuate, that's why we have to expel 1,500 or 1,300 Palestinians or however they're, because we need a military firing zone that we can't do anywhere else. Um, roads, infrastructure, the inequality of infrastructure, re water distribution, all of those things make it, uh, you know, basically the easy, they, bu they build a, a very robust infrastructure for settlement expansion, and they will continue to expand. This government has announced 4,000 new housing units. So all of those things we have to keep our eye on and realize that there is annexation going on all the time. It has not stopped because the government stopped declare, the idea of declaring it. And it, there will be some point of no return even for the Confederation. And whatever that specific point is, you know, I can try to run through all of those, but whatever it is, it will lead me not to a crisis uh, of, of you know, my relationship to Israel because I do live here. I mean, this is where I live. This is my home. Um, it will lead me to a crisis of what kinds of solutions are possible. And at a certain point, you know, we were talking about this, when we get to that point of no return, I say, well, there is only one state running the entire region. It has de demonstrated its intention not only never to leave, but to expand its control. And at a certain point, I'm not sure how we would even implement a two-state confederation or anything. And we'll have to start, you know, acknowledging that the Palestinian claim that we should just be fighting for equal civil rights is the only real realistic approach. I do want to make one more point about point of no return, and that's with relation to Israeli democracy. I personally think Israeli democracy has been very partial and flawed from the start, but to the extent that we have many democratic institutions and practice, the occupation undermines it because it's an undemocratic project. Okay? It's not a democratic way of governing people's lives. You could say, well, those people are not citizens, so that's a sort of way around it. But the fact is, it is the Israelis who are doing it, so it's not democratic practice for Israeli society. But also, it's undermining democracy in terms of governance in Israel. Just look at what happened last week. Our government just fell apart. And it was a pretty functional government, surprisingly. They were getting a lot of stuff done. I can do some shameless self-promotion and say that I wrote a whole article about it uh, in Foreign Affairs. List and it was a long article listing all of the achievements. But this issue tore the government apart because you can't put it aside. And parts of the government had to support a two-tiered legal system that gives, you know, that allows Jews to live as under civil law and keeps Palestinians under martial law. And other parts of the coalition could not vote for that. And so we can't even have our own governance here at home which, if it's gonna topple over that issue. Uh, our entire concept of right, left, and center in Israel, and now I'm speaking in my pollster hat, is completely dominated by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. All other issues, religion and state, how we think about climate, the climate crisis, you know, uh, even economy, is all overshadowed by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, people think about those other things more, but when they put themselves on the right, left, center map, it's all about the conflict. I can't tell you how many times a day I hear Israelis say, I agree with 60 to 90% of the agenda of merits, but I would never vote for a left-wing party. That's a remarkable statement. Everything else in Israeli life is not, accept they would never vote for the party that represents them best because of the conflict. So we're actually, and then, of course, there's the issue of, in recent years, of the attack on Israeli democracy through the attempt to pass undemocratic legislation, and then the attempt to delegitimize the Supreme Court because it's the only body that can reject that kind of legislation through judicial review. And almost all of those pieces of legislation are a derivative of the Israeli-Palestinian or Jewish-Arab problem. And so I think we have to, you know, I think we underestimate to what extent this is not only an unpleasant thing that we do somewhere else because we have no choice and we're forced into it and, you know, things that we tell ourselves, but it is undermining the fundamental basis of Israeli democratic society, culture, and governance, right, you know, even for Israeli citizens. And so that's going to be a point of no return, too, where it might not be our luxury to choose what kind of solution we want, but we may not even be able to choose if we have a democracy. This is sobering, right? And it, it, I think it really, um, in many ways, it, it deepens and also complicates many of the more theoretical discussions that we've been having. I want to take the moment right now to expand the conversation beyond the stage and to invite folks in the audience to ask some questions. Let me give some guidelines, if I may, OK? First, I want to remind you that we're going to take questions and not statements. 
So a question is short and has a question mark at the end. Okay. Second, you know, we have so many beautiful programs together and there's a lot of people who've been asking amazing questions. Let's make space for people who perhaps haven't asked questions yet. We'd love to, to privilege that, to bring as many voices as possible into this house of study. And what we're gonna do, because I see there's a lot of interest in the audience, we're going to take two or three questions at a time, and then you will each get a chance to respond, and maybe we can do a couple of rounds on this. I'm keeping my eye on the watch. Um, do we have a mic that's going to go around? Great, so let's start, yeah, in the back. I, uh, sure, right next to you, Elliot. And just please say your name when you ask the question. Thank you so much. My name is Brandon James. Uh, my question is on the matter of durability. So I'm curious in the conversations you and your peers have about these plans, to what extent does durability come up as far as not just creating a plan that would pass, but a plan that would stick and see its 5, 10, 20th year anniversary? Because it seems like there's the only constant around here is change, whether it's parliament or the state of you know, affairs with Israel and Palestine. So I feel like durability is an important conversation. Thank you. Yes? You're, you're getting a mic right now. Thank you. My name is Karen Marcus. Um, this question applies to both of you. When you, uh, when you think of uh, the opportunity of realizing either a two-state outcome or a confederation, who do you see as the negotiator on the other side? Um, because up until now, there has not been anybody who is willing to negotiate on behalf of the Palestinians when it comes to a two-state solution. One more question, if it's okay, let's pass the mic. Yep, we're there. And just please say your name. Yep. My name is Henry Siegel. I just, quick question. The Confederation model, I can think of a lot of examples in history where it has failed dismally. Can you think of one where it succeeded? Great, so Dada, you wanna start? Um, I'm Michael, you start. So I'll 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 leave that third one for uh, I'll leave that third one for Dahlia since uh, since she she is she's the she's the expert here um, uh, on on that um, I have some thoughts on it but Dahlia, Dahlia is much better place to answer it than I am um, and I guess I'll I'll, I'll go here in, in in reverse order since I since I started or didn't start with number three um, on the second question about the other side so I'm not sure it's accurate to say that there's never been someone on the other side who was willing to negotiate. Uh, with the Israelis over uh, over a two-state outcome, um, I think that we have we have different problems with the past two Palestinian leaders. Um, I think uh, I think that with with Arafat, he had the ability to do it had he wanted. I think he had the legitimacy with Palestinians, and you know I, I think he would have been able to overcome um, some of the difficulties had he agreed to a deal. Uh, I don't think that he actually wanted to agree to a deal. I think that in many ways he like, like, actually, like many, like many first-generation revolutionary leaders, and in many ways that's what he was. And I, I don't say that in a in a derogatory way. Um, I think that he um, very much had the spirit of of revolution and and and, and radicalism. I think Mahmoud Abbas, at different points, from my reading of him, um, was willing to negotiate for a Palestinian state and a two-state outcome. But I'm not sure he ever actually felt he had the legitimacy um, to do so or to make some of the difficult choices on things like right of return or Jerusalem or territory. Um, at the moment, I don't think there's anything that, uh, that Abbas would, would say yes to. Um, I think that he would be willing to negotiate with Israelis. I'm just not sure that there's anything he would say yes to given um, Kind of years, years of disappointment, and, and the fact that his legitimacy is uh, and popularity are probably at their lowest points uh, with Palestinians at the moment. Now, I'll tell you what really worries me is who comes next, because I think that um, having Mahmoud Abbas around for so long, whatever you think of him and whatever his faults are, and there certainly are many, 
Um, he is somebody who has always embraced nonviolence. He has embraced other problematic things, but violence is not one of them. Um, he has, for most of his time, been willing to uh, engage with the Israelis uh, and been willing to enter talks. So I think that this, is, this has been a missed opportunity across successive governments for uh, Israel to do things that would boost him, give him some more popularity and legitimacy, and, and perhaps make it easier for him to get to yes. Whoever comes after Abbas is going to be very different. Um, whether it's one person or whether it's the more likely scenario, I think um, multiple people who are controlling different organs of, of Palestinian institutions and, and Palestinian government. Um, I think that there's going to be a real incentive afterward um, to take a much more hawkish position, particularly as you have rivals who are going to want to compete with each other. And I do worry that um, we may be seeing um, the last Palestinian leader for a while who is both willing and able to negotiate with Israel. Um, the only English language biography that exists of Mahmoud Abbas is a book by, uh, by, by my friends Amir Tibon and Grant, Rum Grant Rumley called The Last Palestinian. They wrote this book in, uh, at this point I think it's four or five, maybe even six years old. And one of the reasons they called it The Last Palestinian um, was because of this sense that whatever happens after Abbas, it will be markedly different. Um, and so I do, I do worry about that. Um, and then quickly on, on the question of durability, listen, any, any outcome that's going to work certainly has to be durable. Um, you know, one of the, one of the reasons that um, I would expect a two-state separation to be durable if the two sides can ever get to there um, is because, A, it will involve lots of negotiation. They'll have sort of gone over every single fine detail. Second, because it will involve a separation. It will involve hard arrangements on the ground that will be more difficult to reverse. Um, again, nothing, nothing is, nothing is forever. Um, but I, I, you know, I think that durability uh, certainly does play a factor. Dalia. Okay, uh, I will do it in the order that we receive them. In terms of durability, yeah, I see anything that you know we call under the rubric of a peace process as three stages: getting to the negotiations, getting through the negotiations. Uh, getting to the right agreement, right, signing the agreement, and then implementation. And that, that includes durability, of course. This is f fundamentally one of the reasons why I think a confederal approach where you have more overlap between the two societies is more viable in the long term, because you have uh, bodies in place to coordinate the kinds of things that are inseparable one way or another. Okay, in a very small strip of land, what we know is that we really can't separate our economic zones, so you'll have to have joint chambers of commerce or whatever it is. Uh, what we also really can't separate are the question of resource management, uh, waste management, water, all the things that you just, nature doesn't know how to put a green line or any kind of line between them. So we'll have to have joint bodies to manage those and they will be built in to the structure. We have to have some sort of coordination on epidemiological policy. We know that now too. We didn't really think about it before 2020, but we know now that we really need those in place and better to have them in place before the next wave, you know. Um, what about general economic viability? This is something I have not really ever understood since I started thinking critically about the two-state partition. How is the Palestinian state economically viable? We, don't, we either maintain the interdependence, in which case it's not really a hard separation, or we you know, lock the door, shut the door, and throw away the key, and you know, good luck. But that will lead quickly to violence, I think. And then in the case of that kind of violence, Israel goes back in, and then it's all over. But if you look at it as a more, um, again, uh, two societies that are more open, you build on the economic overlap, and especially in particular in certain industries, that is already starting to happen today. And I'm thinking, for example, of the high-tech industry. There are already companies that have been quietly, very quietly, outsourcing programming to Gaza programmers. Uh, there is a new program now piloted by the current government to raise the number of work permits, not only for low-skilled laborers, where they are primarily directed, which funnels educated Palestinians into low-skilled jobs, but a pilot program to raise the number of permits in the high-tech sector to 500. Why 500? It should be 5,000 or 50,000. The point is to develop, uh, to help the Palestinian middle class grow in ways that make the, that country economically viable, and I, I have a hard time seeing how that happens without this economic overlap continuing. So I see it as offering much more potential for the kinds of factors in society that lead to a durable and more stable situation. 
That brings me to the second question, because another one of the big problems with Confederation, I'm shocked that nobody raised it because this is really a vulnerability, is the enormous gap of political culture. Israel, with all its flaws and problematic elements of its democracy, is still much more democratic than the Palestinian side. The first people to say this is Palestinians. It's not a democratic society right now. And we're talking about whether we can find a Palestinian leader to lead negotiations. We'll be lucky if we live through the next few months or, you know, I mean, in the sense that if Abu Mazen, may he live a long life, but he's not probably gonna live a long life. And there's a very heated succession debate going on right now. We have only recently had the revelation of who has been tapped in a way to be the potential successor. And I think that we, you know, need to put this into context. We're in a very um, uh, precarious period because all of the competing factions are armed and I'm very worried about it, but let's put that aside. There have been Palestinian leaders who have been willing to negotiate over the years. Yasser Arafat, you know, it's true, of course he was the revolutionary spirit, but he also signed the Oslo 1 in 1993, Oslo 2 in 1995, the Hebron agreements, and went into a negotiation over the most detailed version of the two-state solution, which toppled over very specific points. Did it topple because the two sides really weren't committed to internalizing this idea? Maybe also, but that would be on both sides, okay? I think we have to also look very critically at how much Israel has ever really been willing to accept and internalize the idea of Palestinian sovereign independence. There are many, most of the parties in government openly reject it. So I would be careful about this assumption that Palestinian leaders have not been willing to negotiate seriously. And Mahmoud Abbas also grew out of the Oslo era. He was considered the mo you know, one of the most moderate people in those negotiations and a potential negotiator. Why they haven't happened? Well, we had negotiations. Right? We did have negotiations in 2008 in Annapolis, the 2007-8 process, the process led by John Kerry from 2013 to 2014. Were they serious negotiations? We didn't think so, but in other words, we didn't think they would actually reach an agreement, but the negotiations did happen. And the American government invested a lot of time into them and political capital. So I'm not sure if it's, I, I wouldn't make that generalization about Palestinian leadership, but I do agree that it's going to be a very, very precarious process right now to find any successor, and that brings me to the point about how I see one of the most urgent aspects, regardless of which solution we're talking about, as uh, rehabilitating, resuscitating, um, resurrecting Palestinian democracy. Because how will they ever have legitimate leadership otherwise? How, and also, I think it's only fair to them to live under democratic systems, but that's not really for me to say. And so I think that we should, there's nothing, you know, I'm not saying we Israelis have anything to do or say about that, it's their choice. But to the extent that Israel controls, essentially, through ongoing occupation, it's very hard to develop democratic culture. So I think we have to also take that into account. We are reinforcing the kinds of patterns that lead to them not having a democratic society and therefore not having political legitimacy for their leadership to enter into negotiations. And I've had Palestinians tell me this just yesterday, I was having a conversation. He said, I wouldn't have even voted if there were elections, because the leader we would be voting for wouldn't have any real power, and it would be a fake. We have to understand that that's part of the problem here, too. In terms of the question about um, confederation, failures and successes, so I'd be curious to know which failures you have in mind, but I'll, I'll tell you how I think of it. Now, these are, these are answers that span a long time, okay? And the idea of confederation, it's a problem in political science, and I am a political scientist. Everybody uses the term a little differently, and it's changed over history, but just, as an illustration. Switzerland started as a confederation. Okay, that was in the 14th century. You're right, I can see you rolling your eyes. But now, a days, Switzerland is our paragon of a peaceful country. There's another country that started as a confederation a little more recently, uh, and is also generally associated with a peaceful country in the world, and that's Canada. And that was only in the, yeah, I see a Canadian there going like this, right? And, and, that, was all, you know, and that was only in the 19th century. So that wasn't that long ago, okay. Now, in more recent times, there's an example, now, again, because the terminology gets very murky, a number of the examples I'm about to cite do not call themselves confederation, okay? But they have a number of the elements of a confederation. And one of them is a country where the hybrid approach between separation and togetherness was actually used as a conflict resolution mechanism to end a war, and that's Bosnia. Again, be very careful, they do not call it a confederation. It's called a federation. Don't anybody quote me saying I called it a confederation, but it does have elements of a confederal system. And Bosnia is a mess. I would not recommend it for anybody, but they have not regressed into ethnic conflict or all-out war since 1995. I would like to have 
you know, 25 years of peace or 27 years of peace, even with all the problems. Now, I wouldn't want their problems, but they were also starting from a very different transitional situation. And the other example, uh, well, one, one example that I think is also has numerous confederal elements but is more together because they have a joint parliament is the European Union. You have sovereign countries with borders, open border regime, disconnecting citizenship from residency. People vote where they're from, but they can live and work in other places. Um, and that's been one of the most remarkable successes of the 20th century. They even have a, a joint parliament, so we're not going that far. But I think it's worth looking at that, even though it doesn't call itself a confederation. And then there are two failures that I think are instructive. Okay, one is the European Union, right? We just saw the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. You could say it's a total failure, but they left it voluntarily and they left it peacefully. And there was no war. And so I think that also is a point to keep in mind. The idea of a confederated system is that it's voluntary. I maybe didn't ma mention that before, but if the societies decide they want to change it, it can be a dynamic process. It can move more together, like Canada or Switzerland, or it can move further apart. And the other the more extreme example of that is Serbia and Montenegro, who very briefly, after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, had a confederal-like arrangement in their constitution, which allowed them the constitutional right to separate, which they did by referendum, peacefully. So those are my examples. Thank you, Dalia. Uh, we're gonna take one more series of questions. Um, so if we can start over here, we're gonna get you a mic. Hi, I'm Carol Stockton. I have a question primarily about confederation. I think it is true that there are a number of ideological settlers that will not leave. I think it is also likely that they will um, flagrantly break Palestinian law and thus end up being arrested in mass. And Israel's not gonna do anything? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not understanding how that's gonna work. One question that we have right now. Let's go over here. Hi, I'm Nevit Basker. My question is for Michael. Um, there are two million Israeli Palestinian citizens. Why can there not be 100,000 Israeli citizens or residents of Palestine? Why the assumption that they would have to be evacuated or ethnically cleansed? Great. Uh, in the back over there? Yeah. You know, I'm going to take the last two questions in the back. Right? I saw some hands over there. Back, back, bro. Yeah. Um, I guess I have two sort of like strategy-based questions. Um, sorry, if it's, I have two sort of strategy-based questions because I guess you guys are talking a lot about how we're looking towards what is like a one-state reality in the future, especially, thank you, if we're looking at the way that Israel is looking right now in terms of the peace process. And I guess my two questions are, um, I guess what responsibility we have to make efforts towards peace that are feasible in order to not fuel the myth of intractability and to what extent that even matters since we seem to be running out of time before we reach that point of no return. All right. Hi, my name is Elon Roth and my question is more about how the UN would view this confederation um, in terms of right now Israel and Palestine have different statures within the UN itself. So what would this confederation look like in the international sphere? Okay. Uh, okay, so in terms of when a Palestinian breaks the law and Israel won't do anything. Okay, remember that we're talking about an independent pal sovereign Palestinian state. If they're living under Palestinian sovereignty, it's the Palestinians who have to do something about it. Right. Yeah. So. If that's part of the agreement, they'll have to live with it. But you could also have, I mean, but this is exactly the point. If they are willing to live under Palestinian sovereignty and Israel and Palestinians agree to this kind of plan, Israel will have to agree that people who break the law in Palestine will be judged according to the Palestinian judiciary, judicial system. Yeah. However, I was thinking about this just earlier today. They could also decide that they have an extradition agreement, for example. 
They could decide, they could define what kinds of crimes would subject the perpetrator to an extradition agreement. And I think that would probably be logical, partly for the reasons you're saying, especially because if people are not law-abiding and they lose the right to be a permanent resident, they would have to go back to Israel anyway. So that can be worked out as part of you know, the legal aspects of this arrangement. But yeah, like I said, if people think they're gonna break the law, they might just, you know, they, I mean, I'm not saying people will know this about themselves, but that reality could be part of the reason why the most ideological people who cannot hold back from breaking the law shouldn't be there, one way or another. So I sort of agree with the general direction of the question of why can't there be a Jewish minority in a Palestinian state, but of course they should be law-abiding, and if they can't, they shouldn't be there. And the same thing for Palestinians living in Israel, not talking about citizens. People who are already citizens of Israel never should have their citizens stripped, so uh, I don't even consider that. Um, in terms of risk of responsibility to make feasible efforts, I completely agree. I'm not sure which direction that question was coming from, uh, but I view, at this point, I have come to be, to view what I, basically you, what you call the, you say it's the two-state outcome, not a two-state solution. I've started to refer to this as the traditional two-state solution. And I see the Confederation as a version of two states that I see as more feasible and more reflective of the current physical reality and geopolitical reality. So to my mind, the danger of the traditional two-state solution is that I see it as impossible. That's why I have been working on other ideas. And I think that it is becoming increasingly politically irresponsible to talk about a traditional two-state solution because I think we all know that we're never gonna get there. And so to my mind, where it used to be synonymous with peace, right? When I talked about peace, I meant a two-state solution for the first you know, decade of my life here, at least. But now I've come to see it as in Israeli discourse, when you talk about a two-state solution, it is synonymous with the never-ending process during which Israel expands its control and settlements. So that's why I'm, you know, I, I absolutely agree there's a responsibility towards a more feasible plan. And again, not to say this is like some wonderful, magical, easy solution, but I do think it's more feasible primarily at the negotiation and, and um, implementation stage. Reaching the agreement, I think, will be hard. But I think as a motivating force to get to negotiations, break through some of the obstacles, and in the durability, I think it's gonna be, I think it's better and easier. In terms of the UN and how, I guess the question was like, what is the international personality? So I think the international personality is really two different states. Because that's part of the expression of their national identity. You know, and there shouldn't be a problem for the UN to accept two states in a confederal arrangement that each have a separate international personality. They would certainly coordinate very much over external security, right? They would certainly have to co coordinate together who goes in and out of either state because that person has mostly freedom of movement unless there is a specific security threat. But coordinating your security policy is not exactly the same as coordinating your entire foreign policy. And there shouldn't be any problem with the UN to accept a society like that. I mean, like again, you know, the European Union, all of those states have separate international personalities, even though they coordinate and compromise many aspects of their sovereignty. So on the, on the question of, um, of why can't 100,000 Israelis stay in, in the state of Palestine, um, from my perspective, I think that all 100,000 Israelis should be offered Palestinian citizenship, and if they want to stay, they can stay as citizens of the state of Palestine. Um, but I don't think that any of them would accept that. Um, I don't think that any of them would be willing to actually live in a state of Palestine and respect the, the laws of a state of Palestine. Um, and that's, that's where the problem comes in. Um, and you certainly can't have enclaves of Israeli citizens living inside of a Palestinian state. The, the Trump plan provided for 17 such enclaves. The security would require you know, to do that and the friction it would cause would, would blow up the entire thing. Um, so I think they should be given the option, especially you know, since we're talking about not, not huge numbers, um, and especially considering that in any two-state uh, in any two-state separation, um, I fully expect that there will be some number of Palestinians who are granted a right of return inside of Israel. Um, I don't know that it'll be even as high as 100,000, but there will be some. Um, and so I think that Israelis should be offered the same choice. But as I said, I, I would be shocked if, if any of them take it. Um, on the question of uh, on the question of you know ob obligations uh, and feasibility, so I'll I'll focus on the the obligation part of it. Um, you know I think that um, if I were an Israeli citizen and I am not, um, but if I were, I would 100% um, view myself and my government as having an obligation to try to solve this problem 
for moral reasons, for practical reasons, for political reasons, uh, for the future of the state, for the, for the future of, of my, my children and grandchildren. As an American Jew, um, I also think that we have an obligation to try and help the two sides get, get to this point. Now, different people embrace that obligation if they choose to assume it uh, in different ways. Um, I think that uh, for me, the job of American Jewry is to consistently communicate to our elected leaders that we view the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as important, that we view it as an American foreign policy goal. Um, I think it's important to communicate to our Jewish community leaders that we want to see this resolved, that it impacts our relationship with Israel, that it impacts our American Jewish identity, um, and that we want to see it in a way, uh, resolved in a way that, that meets our values. So I think that whether you are Israeli or, or you are American, um, I absolutely view all of us as having an obligation to do what we can um, to push everybody who has uh, the power to solve this to try and solve it. Needless to say, I agree with that too. I actually think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. You know, Peter in the back? You can get your mic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Peter Joseph. Thank you guys very much for a terrific conversation this evening. I ask this question with a great deal of trepidation. Uh, and that is, we hear about conditions not being correct for progress. Both, Dahlia, your rendition of issues is certainly on the Israeli side, and we all have spoken at length about the conditions on the Palestinian side. So my question is really, you know, are you talking to the right audience here? This is a group of North American Jews who care deeply about the state of Israel, who care deeply about progress, but are rendered, you know, just without really any means of having an impact. And the impact has to really be here. So I ask you how you guys can move that forward and how we can move that forward, taking into account that the decisions and the conditions can only take place within these societies. And we don't live here, and we don't have vote here, and we don't pay taxes here. And despite all of our efforts, politically and otherwise, within the United States, clearly we've had a very limited impact over a long period of time. So, so I'm just going to invite you to respond to this question and to add to it any last closing comments that you want to add. We're going to end with this. Um, so. You know, that's a, that's a question that could, that could take up an, an hour and a half on its own, I think. Um, but my, my short answer to that question, Peter, is that, and I'll, since, we're, since we're sitting here in a, um, in, in a Hartman space, I'll, um, I'll, I'll reference some, some very, very Hartman-y ideas. Um, starting with peoplehood, right? If we, if we take the notion of peoplehood seriously, um, then I think, we have to impress upon our Israeli friends, cousins, siblings, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever term you want to use, that this is important to us, and hope that they take those views seriously. And I think that, um, you know, in some ways, in the past few years, we've seen evidence that Israeli governments are less willing to take the views of American Jews seriously. Um, and in some ways, we've seen Israeli governments actually um, endorse and promote this notion of peoplehood um, and try to position Israel even more so as the state of all the Jews as opposed to just the state of Israelis. Now, ultimately, the decision is not going to be up to us North American Jews. It's going to be up to Israelis. It's going to be up to Palestinians. Um, but I don't think that, I don't think I would go so far as saying that we have no impact here. Um, and I think that that's part of why it's so important to maintain this relationship with Israel, to maintain our Zionism, um, so that we can continue to try to have an impact. Because without the strong relationship that exists between American Jews and Israel, 
I can guarantee you that then we absolutely will have zero impact. And then it really won't be, won't be relevant to us at all to be discussing different political ideas and political solutions um, and, and how, they can, how they can come about. So um, I think that we, we, have to, we have to try and, and recognize the power that we have, even if it's limited, and try to, um, try to grow it and, and try, to, try to leverage it um, in, in different ways. Um, but I acknowledge it can be, it can certainly, you know, Dal Dahlia is in a different situation because she, she is an Israeli, but um, certainly for me, it can be deeply frustrating to be spending so much time on this issue when I know that my direct impact and the direct impact of North American Jewry um, is always going to be limited in some way, shape, or form. Tough question. I mean, I hear this question a lot, but it never gets easier. Um, I think in terms of what to do here in Israel, I, you know, I personally I do everything I can in the sense that um, on the issue of what kind of solution to reach, the fact that we're still thinking about it in Israel is not to be taken for granted. Most Israelis are not, and much of the political leadership is not. So just we're trying to keep it on the agenda, uh, both by advocating a solution or an outcome and developing an idea for what we think is a little more motivating as an approach. But over the years, I mean, my approach has been you know, to try every arena where I have any connection. So I've worked in the political arena, trying to work for political parties that I think are committed to these goals, which I have over the course of eight elections. Look where that's gotten me. Um, I work through civil society, right? I've worked, I, as, a, as a consultant, I work with all of the, organ pretty much every organization that deals with, it used to be in the first, I would say in the 2000s, they were all peace organizations. In the 2010s, it became all human rights organizations, which should tell you something about the way the struggle is going. You know, who's taking the lead on these things? And what I'm doing for them is trying to help them understand Israeli society and how they can communicate with them and how they can understand them and how they can best try to generate a social awareness and interest and support for advancing either peace or human rights or some version of that. Of course, I also work on many other issues, you know, like the ones you read off in my bio, but so I'm working through politics, I'm working through civil society, and I'm working through journalism because I feel like, you know, all the academic work in the world and all the internal policy reports and memos that I write you know, ultimately you need to have a feedback loop with the public. And so I try to write as much as I can. Now it's true that I'm a little bit lazy and I write mostly in English. I try to write in Hebrew sometimes. But, you know, the ideas get out and there is a feedback loop and that's, you know, my vain and probably egotistical hope that somehow or other, between all of these levels, I can have my minimal impact. Um, but I, my, my general feeling is that you know, the Thousand Flowers image is a real one. When people come to me and say, do you think it's a good idea to start an organization that will do whatever? I say, sure, anything. Because none of us know what will be the tipping point. You know, none of us know what kind of perfect storm we need, you know, in order to be able to change, to have a major change of policy. If you look at major issues that have changed in the US over time, and I'm thinking of a quintessential one, which is definitely a progressive issue, but LGBT rights, okay? Look at where we were 30, 40 years ago. It didn't change overnight. It took 30, 40 years and you know, centuries of people suffering, but social activism at many levels to get there. And progress is you know, steps forward and steps behind and nonlinear and takes civil society and crises and politicians and whatever else. I can't tell you what the next thing will be that will help, but I would say let's just do all of them. And in terms of the US, uh, from the US side of it, you know, to my mind, the obvious answer is basically be, be, be like Michael. You know, in other words, try to influence the policy community in the US. Okay, we may not agree on a few points of how to do a two-state solution, but it doesn't matter, right? It's just the, you know, the, I think the American government right now is, I understand them, but it's frustrating that they're at a point where they say there is no point for us to expend political capital on trying to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's a losing prospect. The Israeli government doesn't want it. The Israeli government has more power. The Palestinian leadership is a mess. Why should we bother? Let's settle for economic development. Okay, I'm not against economic development, but it's not a replacement. It will never be a replacement for a political resolution. And so I think that you have, you know, a very well-developed American culture of influencing your policymakers and making your voices heard. So you should be doing that in addition to what you're doing now, which is coming here and learning from, by seeing for yourselves, which I think is a great thing. Um, and that's what I have to say in terms of answering the question. In terms of my own final thoughts, I mean, uh, it gets very frustrating because, you know, I moved here thinking I was going to help make peace in the 1990s and it's been a lot of time and the things have just gotten worse. But I don't, 
I don't have any other way of dealing with the situation. I mean, I, I have a pretty good quality, I have luckily very good quality of life here. I feel very privileged. But I would never be able to make it if I wasn't working on this issue. And I don't think that ongoing, uh, I don't think our self-determination as Jews can ever come at the permanent expense of self of other people's self-determination. It cannot. You know, the right to self-determination and international norms, one of the shining, you know, norms of the 20th century, cannot be qualified to say, your self-determination comes at the expense of someone else's. So I don't want us to lose the right of self-determination. I don't even know if there is such a thing in international affairs. I hope we don't have to get there, but we cannot sustain a situation where we're undermining other people's fundamental rights and basically violating human nature. You know, even if it wasn't a right in the 20th century in the international system, people always know that they need to have independence or uh, an expression of their identity and to determine their own fate, and it will never go away. So we might as well try to find a way to do it where we contain the violence through political channels. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dahlia.